So there's the case with the magnets in it. There's the back plate. There's the armature assembly. Hi, I'm Tim Westcott, and this is a DC motor. And this is a DC motor. This DC motor is by no means the smallest DC motor that is made. And this is by no means the largest DC motor that it's made. Today, I'm going to talk about DC motors. I'm going to talk about how they're constructed, and I'm going to talk about how they work. And I hope that when I'm done with this video, that you'll have a basic understanding of the magic that goes on inside of one of these little cans that turns electricity on one end into a turning shaft on the other. Any electric motor turns electrical energy into mechanical energy. That's kind of the definition of a motor. A DC motor does it in a certain way. It takes electricity in and it turns it into a magnetic field and it uses that magnetic field in opposition with another magnetic field inside the motor to turn the shaft. And I'm going to show you how that works. Now let's zoom in on a motor and I'll take it apart for you and I'll show you all of the pieces that are inside. I've already kind of done violence to this motor. You can see right here, I, uh, I ground off the tabs that hold it together. The, the construction of this motor is pretty typical in that it has this stamped steel can and then it has a nylon backplate and the backplate is just held onto the can with little tabs that fold over. I don't know if it'll come out but here's a view of those tabs on a motor that's whole and that's what they look like and they just catch that back panel. Because I've already cut those tabs off I can just pull this back plate off Okay, and you can see right there, the first things that you see are, these are the motor brushes right here, and those are what contact the commutator, they make the electrical contact to send the current through the wires, and then, can't really get the brushes out of the way, but there's a bronze bearing in the middle of that back plate and that's what the motor shaft rides on. Now this is just a plane bearing. It's called a journal bearing or, or a plane bearing. And all it is is it's just, it's just some bronze. It might be oil light with a little bit of grease impregnated in it, but it's just a plain old bearing. There's no fancy ball bearings in this particular motor. So these brushes are on springs. That's probably beryllium copper because it's nice and springy and conducts electricity well. And then those are cleverly folded and shoved through slots in the uh, nylon and they come out to the contacts on the outside of the motor. And this is where, if you were building a device, you would solder wires onto there or you would have connectors that you would push onto there. And you can get your motors, if you're getting high quantities of motors, if you're actually building a product, you can get your motors terminated with connectors or wires or all sorts of different things. Uh, generally, when you get them on the surplus market, they, uh, they just have tabs that look like that and you need to solder to them. Now getting into this motor a little farther, we can look down the inside of this motor and the two main parts of this are the armature and the stator. And let me pull that armature out of there. Okay, and that's the armature. Now if you look at all those little lines there, those little lines, each one of those lines is between a pair of steel armature sections. And each one of those armature sections is treated so that it isn't electrically conductive. It's either got varnish on it or they've carefully oxidized it or something. And then they've stacked them all together onto the motor shaft. And the reason that you have all of those little individual sections is because when the motor's running, it's basically got a varying magnetic field on this armature. This is, this is the end of a magnet. And that magnetic field is constantly changing polarity. 
And if you had just one solid chunk of steel there, then it would want to set up circulating electric currents in there. And those circulating electric currents would basically waste energy. They'd oppose the magnetic field, and because the metal is resistive, they'd, they'd burn up all your motor energy heating up the armature instead of making things turn, which you don't want. So there's a whole bunch of little flat sections that make up the armature. And there's a coil of wire wound around each armature tooth, and that makes up the armature. And then those wires connect up to this thing, and I don't know if it really shows well in the video, but there's three sections of metal there, and those make contact with the brushes. This is called the commutator, and the brushes and the commutator working together are what constantly change the direction of the magnetic field on that armature so that it stays in tune with the direction of the magnetic field on the stator and keeps the thing turning. And it's just a simple shaft. There's a couple of little things. There's this collar here and that just keeps the motor in place. And there's a, there's a washer there that I assume has to do with making the bearings last a good long time. So that's the, that's the armature. And then the last piece of this is the can. And the top part of that, there's another bearing. And notice that they didn't just drill a hole in the can. That's another bronze bearing. Um, here again, it's probably oilite. And inside the can, there's a couple of magnets. The way these magnets are built is that they're opposite polarity. So one of these faces will be a north pole and the other one will be a south pole. And so between the two of them, there's a magnetic field set up that runs that way across that case. And that is all of the pieces of the motor. Let's put that back together. And inside the case, there's two magnets. Now, when you, when you build a motor like this, each, each face of the magnet that's showing, if, it's, if it is the opposite polarity from the magnet next to it, is called a pole. So this is a two-pole motor because it has a, there's a north face and a south face in here. I can't tell you which one is north and which is south, but I know that one is north and one is south. They're opposite polarity. They set up a magnetic field that goes across the motor like that. Now, you can have motors that have four magnets or six or eight, and when they have more magnets, then usually they have more poles. Now, put all those pieces together, lay them out for you, and you can take a look. So there's the case with the magnets in it. There's the back plate. And there's this there's the armature assembly. Okay. Now that you've seen what's inside of a motor. Let me start showing you how the motor works. Now first to show you how this motor works, I'm going to start without what's called commutation, and then I'll show you how commutation works. So, look, look at this graphic. And that's a, that's a graphic of the motor that I'm going to be talking about. It's a cartoon representation of the motor that I just showed you. The gray circle is the steel case around the outside, and those two semicircles that are each red and blue are the magnets. And you see that the, the red part you can think of as the north pole of the magnet, and the blue is the south pole. And then inside of that, there's an armature. And that armature is energized so that it has a north pole and a south pole. And we're just going to keep that armature energized the same way through this demonstration so that you can see what happens. Right now, the top tooth of the armature is the north pole of the magnet. And the bottom tooth of the armature is the south pole. And that top tooth is sitting right next to the north pole of the fixed magnet. And it, so it wants to push away. So it wants to push away over this direction. And the bottom tooth of that rotor is a south pole, and it wants to pull in towards the fixed magnet. So now let's let it go, and let's watch what happens. Okay, did you see that? The armature turned 
so I got some I got some work out of my motor because the armature turned and it but it all it did was line up the armature magnets with the magnets on the inside of the motor and it didn't keep turning. And that's not normally what we want from a motor. So a motor that only turns a little bit and then stops is not it's not interesting. So the way that a motor works to keep turning is that it has brushes and a commutator. And I showed you the brushes and commutator earlier. And now let's see those at work. So let's replace that motor from before with one that has brushes and commutators working. And you can see that the teeth of the armature that are switched in are constantly changing. So as that armature turns, the commutator and the brushes are always switching things around so that the armature has a north pole at the top and it has a south pole at the bottom. And so the armature always wants to turn so that those are lined up, but as it turns, the, the but as it turns, the commutator keeps switching that north pole back to the top, and it keeps switching the south pole back to the bottom, and that just keeps the motor turning and turning and turning, and it constantly puts out torque, and that's exactly what we want from an electric motor. Now, what I've shown you so far in this kind of operation of the thing is just a a basic DC motor. I've shown you just, you know, just the basics, a three-tooth armature and a, and a two-pole magnet assembly. But that's not the only variation that you can have in a DC motor. People have been making DC motors now for over a hundred years, and there's an almost infinite variety of ways to do this. The first difference that you see when you start looking at different motors is you can have more than one pair of poles in the magnet assembly. Now they always come in pairs because you've always got to have an alternating, you know, you've got to have a north pole and then a south pole and then a north pole and then a south pole. So that always has to alternate, which means it always has to come in pairs. But the number of teeth on the armature can be pretty much anything as long as it's got a brush assembly on it so that there's a part of the armature that's trying to get dragged towards the correct pole of a magnet, then um, then you can have as many teeth as you want. And it's pretty common for motors to have different numbers of teeth. Generally, when you see a motor that has just two poles and three slots in the armature, it's a motor that's designed to be as high speed as possible. So one of the first things that you see is motors that are designed to be good at putting out torque at lower speeds will have more magnets and they'll have more slots on the armature. Now I haven't had this guy apart, but I suspect that there's far more than three slots on the armature and I wouldn't be at all surprised if it didn't have a four pole or six or even eight poles in the motor. I, I don't know, I haven't taken it apart, but, but somewhere in there I suspect is something a lot more fancy than the, the pieces that I showed you. This is a five slot armature. So it's built very much like that three slot armature that I showed you before. The only difference is that instead of having three teeth on the armature, it's got five and it's got five contacts on the commutator. And the reason that you do this is because you can get smoother torque delivery with more teeth on your rotor. The other thing that you can have is the the motor that I showed you taken apart is a conventional motor. It's got a steel armature and it's got all the windings on that armature. But that tends to be very heavy. That armature is very heavy and that's a great big rotating assembly that if you want to speed the motor up and slow it down quickly or if you want to reverse directions on the motor quickly, that's a whole lot of inertia that you've got to overcome just in the motor. So there's a kind of motor called a coreless motor that replaces that steel armature with a basket of wire. So basically what they do is they essentially take everything away from the armature except for the wire and a little holder and the brushes. And they take the wire, they form it into a basket. And then inside of this basket, they put their magnet assembly. So the magnets are inside of that and they're facing out. And then on the outside of that, they put an iron shell, and that makes a motor. And then because the 
armature assembly is only the wire, it's a lot lighter and the motor can respond a lot quicker. Now if you look at this really closely, you'll see that this is actually a five, uh, this is a five tooth rotor. And then if you look behind it, you'll see that there's a, behind the rotor, there's a part that rotates with the case. So I'm going to spin this fast enough so that it kind of disappears. And you can see behind that. And that stuff in the middle there, that's the magnet assembly. So the magnets are on the inside, and then the case is steel. It carries the magnetic lines of force back around to the other side. And then it's got this basket weave of copper wire that goes down that actually forms the, the motor part. You see that in systems that have servo motors. And I don't just mean little radio control model airplane servos. I mean anything that has a position control system that needs to respond quickly. Chances are there's going to be a coreless motor in there so that it can really be snappy in its response. The other thing that you can do with a motor, a motor doesn't actually have to have a rotational output. You can essentially take that magnet assembly and you can lay it out flat. So you can just have a magnet that go, you know, north pole, south pole, north pole, south pole in this big long track. And then you can have an armature assembly that rides on top of that on bearings. And you can do the whole arrangement. It's just that the armature will travel back and forth on this track. That's called a linear motor. And they're generally used in higher tech applications, but where you need a sensitive servoing and you want to be able to drive it directly because you want speed or because you want precision, then a linear motor can really shine. Now the other thing to note about motors is that motors can come in various different aspect ratio. And by aspect ratio, I mean how, how, how skinny is it or how fat is it versus how long is it. So for instance, this motor is pretty skinny and then the motor section itself is that long. So that's a pretty long, slender motor. There are motors called pancake motors. And the pancake motors that I've personally seen, I've seen ones that run up to about this big around, and the whole motor assembly is about that thick. And those, the particular one that I saw was used, it was a very slow motor, and it was designed to generate as much torque as it could for its weight. Um, so that's one place where you see pancake motors. The other place where you might see a pancake motor is because that's the only space available in the machine that you're building to fit a motor. And generally, pancake motors, because they're very large diameter and thin, they tend to be slow speed and lots of torque for their size. So there you are. There's the basics of how DC motors are put together and how they work. And I hope, I hope you found this video informative this is actually something that I'm pretty enthusiastic about, so I'm trying to restrain myself here. But I do encourage you that if, you, if you're just curious or if you need to make these things work for you in your job or for whatever reason, go out and get some of these motors. You can always get junk toys or you can go buy motors on the surplus market. Get them and take them apart look at what's inside, figure out how they're working, compare the motors that you're looking at with the motors that I've shown you and see if you can't work out why they've done what they've done. People have been making DC motors for over a hundred years now and there's just an infinite variety of different ways that you can make them and different quality levels and different performance levels. It's just a fascinating topic and should you ever need to apply DC motors in your hobby or in your work, the more stuff that you know about them, even if it seems like useless trivia when you learn it, the better you'll be able to do the work that you want to get done. So thank you very much for watching my video.